hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is the third in our series of Build Back Better webinars looking at the impact of COVID-19 and what we can do about it. Today we're going to focus on back to school in a pandemic, but we're actually going to look at, at all phases of education. So we'll be looking at the impact that COVID has had on education, as well as what we can do in the immediate recovery period. And then any ideas from our panelists and from you on the line for using this period of disruption to improve the education system and reset it for the better. Um, we're going to keep you all on mute since there's so many of you on the line, but if you do have a question, you can type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also raise your hand. So there's another button at the bottom of the screen. And if you've typed a question, you can raise your hand to make sure that we've seen it. If it looks like we haven't, we haven't seen it and we're not addressing it. We're going to try and cover a few of the questions, particularly any clarification questions as we go through. But otherwise, we'll leave meteor questions till the end. And just to let you know, this session is being recorded, so it will be available on our website a day or two after the webinar. Great, on to the next slide. So here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, next slide, I think, great, fantastic. So here's what we're covering. So firstly, I'm going to introduce our fantastic speakers. Uh, then we're going to briefly recap the impacts of COVID-19 on education. Then we'll go into how to help learners across all phases of education catch up. That's where we'll spend the bulk of our time. Then, as I say, we'll, we'll look at how to reset the education system for the better, and we'll try to make sure we save a little bit of time for questions at the end. So on to introducing our speakers. So I'm really delighted that we've got three fantastic speakers here today, and thank you so much for making the time to, to join and putting together some interesting slides and insights for us. First, we're going to have Jonathan Kay, who's the toolkit lead at the EEF. Next, we've also got Natalie Pereira, executive director and head of research at EPI. And finally, we've got our own Raj Chande, who is both a principal advisor here and led the education team for many, many years, set it up and led it, and is now working as a part-time teacher at Mossbourne Academy. So we'll be talking both about behavioral insights, the sort of theory and principles, but also how things are actually playing out on the front line. Um, and with that, in the interest of time, let's jump right in. So we're going to begin, as I say, with the impact of COVID-19 on education. So looking at some of these sort of dr dramatic um, changes and disruption that we've all experienced. And we're going to start by passing over to Jonathan at EEF. So over to you, Jonathan. Hi. Yeah, so, so at the EEF, we've, uh, we've mainly focused on the impact of COVID, uh, particularly on academic attainment and, and particularly with a focus um, on our core mission, which is closing the, the disadvantage gap uh, between rich and poor pupils uh, within the UK education system. So if we could move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, they, we, we've got now quite clear evidence that uh, COVID is having a, a, a negative impact, particularly for disadvantaged people. So, so when you look at learning rates, um, uh, typically learning rates seem to, to, to be down for everyone, um, but particularly down for, for pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds. And to summarize the evidence base, that there are kind of three key uh, areas that we've looked at to, to begin making this claim. So, so we started off by uh, looking historically at the impact of, of school closures and, and obviously this isn't ever going to be directly analogous to the situation that we, we have at the moment, but there is clear uh, evidence that when schools close, pupils learn less um, and particularly pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds learn less. So uh, we conducted a, a rapid evidence assessment that gathered together um, all of the research on, for example, uh, school closures during the summer period, also things like snow days and, and other reasons for school closures to begin examining the impact of this. And there was a clear pattern that, that disadvantaged pupils uh, learn, learn less um, and, uh, and learn less particularly in comparison to, to people from, from non-disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, you can then also look at some of the reasons for this. So, so surveys that have taken place during this period of school closures uh, give us some explanatory power to, to believe that this is playing out and that the same kind of issues are, are occurring in the, the current climate. So um, survey results, particularly from, from organisations like the Sutton Trust, have, have begun to show that disparities um, have occurred in terms of provision during this period. So, so that might be access to technology, that might be level of parental support, um, but that might also be overall learning time. So, so there's initial evidence that, that people from disadvantaged backgrounds that have, have simply been able to spend less time uh, learning during the period of school closure, which, which as I said, should, 
would lead to, to this expected increase in the attainment gap. Uh, and then finally, we're getting early data that, that actually begins to back up these claims by testing people at, it, at the moment. So uh, one really interesting report recently was by the Royal Society Delve Initiative, um, which pulled out some early data and, and used online testing to begin measuring the impact of people between the start of lockdown and, and, and the current time. And, and that's already showing gaps beginning to increase. Um, so, so, so those are three clear uh, uh, reasons to justify the idea that, that the impact on the academic attainment gap has increased. Uh, one final point that, that I think is worth making here is um, there is no easy solution. So, so, so as we go back, um, if we go back in a staggered manner, this might actually increase the uh, attainment gap. So there's lots of evidence that schools are, are fairly well equipped to deal with mass absences and school closures, but are much less well equipped to deal with a few students uh, going back or all but a few students going back. So, so absenteeism, the, the, the literature on that is, is much, shows a much more profound negative impact. So we need to be careful at, at making sure that as we go back, that people feel safe to go back and we don't have some people going back, but, but others not feeling comfortable to, to return. Brilliant, thank you so much for, for covering that. And, and just to say, I think your research here has been um, fantastic, incredibly helpful, and, and also quite scary, just given the extent um, of the negative impact. I, I think uh, looking across all the studies, the, the mean impact was that inequality would increase by about 36%, which is pretty scary. And I know 90% of teachers have reported that pupils are doing less or much less work than usual. Um, and about a, a fifth or two million did no school work at all or less than an hour a day. So some very scary figures there. I'm going to pass over to Natalie in a moment, but just a, a quick reminder that if you have a question, you can put up your hand, but everyone's going to remain muted. So that's only to flag to us that you've asked a question in the Q&A. So um, um, Lucy, I see you've got your hand up. If you type your question into the Q&A, we'll get to it there. Um, and over to you, Natalie, and to the next slide, please, Ashley. Great, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, so there, as Jonathan said, EEF have done um, some incredibly important and helpful work on, um, on estimating the impact of the, uh, on the gap from COVID. Um, what we have done in EPI is every year we do um, an annual report which measures the disadvantage gap at different stages of the education um, system. And I thought it's just worth reiterating what the context looked like even before COVID. So we get a sense of that kind of very steep challenge that we're facing. Um, so very briefly then, on the left side of the screen is um, a graph showing how the disadvantage gap stood at the end of 2018 or for those who took national exams in, uh, in the summer of 2018. Um, we do have updated figures for 2019, but that will be published in a couple of weeks because we're still QAing that. Um, but you can see that the gap between um, disadvantaged pupils and their peers um, in 2018 was just over 18 months. So these are pupils who have been eligible for, who are eligible for the pupil premium. So they've been eligible for free school meals for uh, at any point in the previous six years. Um, so just over 18.1 months in uh, secondary school just over nine months by the end of primary and around four and a half months in the early years. And actually another interesting thing we found when we tracked a single cohort um, a few years ago was that about 20%, sorry, 40% of the gap in secondary school is already evident in the early years. It grows by a further 20% by the end of primary um, and then the final 40% of that gap um, emerges over the course of secondary. So the way to look at it is that it's 40% is there by the end of the early years by age five, further 20% and then a further 40% by the end of secondary. On the right hand side of the graph, we look at persistently disadvantaged pupils. And this is really important because these are pupils who have been eligible for free school meals, 
for at least 80% of their school lives. So we can think of them as being um, quite, quite persistently in poverty, in workless households for most of their lives. And we can see here that the gap is much wider at um, knocking on two years by the end of secondary um, and over a year by the end of primary. In our annual report, which I won't uh, go into now, but you, we also show how that varies across um, regions and localities in the country and also amongst different um, types of ethnic groups and categories of special educational needs. Um, and then next slide, please. We also look at the post-16 gap. And is it okay to move to the next slide? I think the system is just a little slow. But okay. There we go. Uh, so we look at the post-16 gap, and I don't have an infographic here, but what we found is that there has been um, uh, that the inequality of post-16 routes has been increasing over time. So in a perfectly equitable society, we would see the same proportion of poor kids and non-poor kids going on to academic routes versus vocational routes versus no route at all. Clearly, we don't want any uh, young person going into no route at all. Um, but actually, the, 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 the pathways have become more inequitable over time. And that sector has also um, faced challenges in terms of um, decreases to funding since 2011-12. And then COVID brings new challenges in relation to the um, unstable um, GCSE and A-level results that will come out over the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, the lost learning time on um, all types of courses. And then, of course, for older students, the risk of long term unemployment as we head into um, an inevitable recession. Thank you so much, Natalie. Just a quick question came in. Were your initial statistics based just on England? They were, yeah. I should have said that. Yeah. And, and I should say also um, EEF's analysis looked at global studies on the impact of lost learning. And we have seen that various studies around the world have found that COVID has had a very similar impact. So obviously different countries have been have had school closures for different periods of time. And so the impact in terms of lost learning and inequality will vary depending on how long it's lasted. But in the US, for example, some interesting analysis of a common learning platform called Zern suggests that um, in high income areas, people are completing about 10% less work than before the crisis. And in low and middle income areas, they're completing between 50% and 60% less work than before. So again, very similar statistics to what we see here and I think replicated around the world. Um, uh, over to you, Raj, for um, some insights from sort of within the school setting. Uh, thanks, Anna. Morning, everyone. I I'll keep it short as well, because I think in terms of the overview, EEF and EPI, Jonathan and Natalie have covered that really well and in and fantastic depth. Just a couple of practical things that I noticed which really confirm it. Um, both during school closures and when we came in, it was really, really difficult to get hold of the disadvantaged and lower attaining students. We knew that the families had challenges. Um, we were setting work and it wasn't always getting done and engagement was worryingly low. So really just confirming on the ground what others are reporting at a macro level. The second point that I just want to spend a little bit of a moment on, I think it's really helpful and EF have been at the forefront of this, I think, but to think of months of progress as being a helpful way of thinking how students are making their way through education. I think I have found myself falling into the trap of thinking, okay, so in March we were, you know, just going along here and then we paused and maybe we've lost about three or four months and we'll pick it back up. And I don't think it's gonna be that simple. Uh, every lesson I've ever taught has some element of revision where you're cementing prior learning. And we know this from you know, the evidence, the pedagogical research, kids need to be revising stuff constantly to cement knowledge. When we go back into the lessons, I'm pretty sure some of those kids won't have rearranged an equation for the best part of four months, unless they have some strange ways of spending their summer holidays. So, there's going to be a big heavy lift just revising what we did before 
So I just want us to be mindful, it's not just that opportunity cost of time that we've missed, we may have to go back and do a whole bunch of reteaching of previous stuff as well, which I'm quite concerned about, and I'm sure we'll all discuss that in the next section when we talk about recovery strategies. Thank you, Raj, and thank you all of you for providing such good insights there on what we've seen so far. And just to reiterate that the challenges that have been described here really do play out across all phases of education. So certainly what we've seen from, from the data that's been coming out so far is that in the early years, um, it's just as um, challenging and perhaps even more so. So we've seen that parents of children under five have actually reported more than others that there's been a negative impact on their child's well-being, although well-being impacts have been felt across all children and parents homeschooling. And then parents of children under five have felt particularly stressed by childcare arrangements, even more so than parents of older children who are doing homeschooling. Um, and again, in the post-16 area, very similar issues, um, leading also to, to some students to consider not actually continuing with their plans to go to university. So 17%, almost a fifth, changing, potentially changing their mind about university. And given what Natalie was saying about the risks of unemployment, particularly for the young, that's, that's very worrying. Um, but let's move on to what we can do about this. So let's look at some of the immediate recovery ideas. If we could flip forward two slides, please, Ashlyn, and back over to you, Jonathan. I want to the next slide, there we go. Right. So, so I'll first kind of talk through some of the things we can do to support remote learning, because I think we are still going to be in a period where with local lockdowns and, and other circumstances, we, we will end up needing to continue doing elements of remote learning. And then I'll talk a bit more about compensation and, and, and ways to try and recover the, the learning lost over this period. Um, so, so quickly on remote learning, um, we did a, a rapid evidence assessment that tried to gather uh, the, the evidence for best strategies of teaching remotely or, or learning remotely. Um, and, and to be honest, the headline is that there just isn't a lot of evidence. So, so a lot of this is drawn from uh, the higher education sector. Uh, and actually a take home for me is that, that we need to be finding ways to monitor what's effective and to share best practice between schools and, and, and really gain an understanding of, of what is working. But there are a few uh, interesting take home messages that, that I think we can draw from the literature. So first and foremost, it's that teaching quality is the most important thing. So early on in, in lockdown, we saw a lot of debates about the importance of synchronous lessons and, and, and live lessons. And um, this isn't to say that, that synchronous lessons shouldn't play a part. Uh, but, but we certainly think that teaching quality is the starting point and we should be starting from the principles of, of what is good pedagogy. So high quality feedback, high quality interaction, and then working out the way to deliver those because when high quality pedagogy is delivered on different platforms, actually the, the differences don't seem particularly uh, significant. Um, and, and then also a couple of, of other things to, to pick out. And, and I recommend that if anyone's interested in this, that they go and read full, uh, the, the full report. Um, one that I think is particularly interesting is that peer interactions seem particularly important. So, so there is evidence that where uh, remote learning allows peers to interact, either through, um, through sharing learning, peer marking, or, or direct interaction in a kind of online classroom environment, that seems to be really good for learning. It seems to have impacts on, on academic attainment. And you can also imagine that, that it has uh, good impacts on things like motivation, which can be particularly difficult uh, in long periods of of online learning um, but but yeah there, there, there are lots of other kind of interesting messages so, so considering how we can support pupils to work independently might also be particularly important as we move to to more blended approaches or, or potentially rolling lockdowns uh, if you could move to the next slide please And, uh, and then the next stage, once we start to have um, everyone back in school, is going to be considering how we compensate for, for those learning losses that, that I initially described. Um, and, and what we've really done is at the EF is try to set out the principles and the evidence behind various described and, and discussed approaches, uh, because we think that the best uh, way to approach this is for teachers to really have the lead and, and schools to have the lead um, in working out what's going to be appropriate for their particular cohorts of pupils. Um, but we feel like the evidence community has, a, has an important responsibility in providing information on, on what might be particularly promising. So to run th few, through a few of these and, and pick out a few kind of key examples, um, on the right is a, is a guide that we've put out for schools, which is aimed to help inform uh, how schools might spend the, the £650 million that's been allocated for uh, the provision of, of catch-up during this period. 
Um, and, and first and foremost, uh, again, to pick out is the importance of supporting great teaching. So, so all of the evidence shows that, that the best way to impact students' academic attainment is to really focus on high quality teaching. Uh, in this period, that might mean making time to allow teachers to actually plan uh, changes to the curriculum which might be necessary in the school year. It might also be allowing teachers to, to have training on, on things like additional technology that, that might need to be used uh, when we have periods of, of uh, kind of rolling learning. Um, and also it might mean a focus on things like pupil assessment and feedback which we think are going to be particularly important when people are coming back at, at different levels of learning. Uh, then the next section that we focus on it is more of the targeted approaches and, and I'll get on to talk a, a bit more in detail about one-to-one -one and small group tuition and why we think that's particularly effective um, but, but we also discuss the evidence behind different things that have been discussed so there might be other intervention programs for example social and emotional learning interventions that, that schools might need to consider. There's also been discussion about things like extending school time um, and, and schools may want to do this but, but we think it's important to highlight the challenges of this so so there is evidence that extending school time does have an impact but but also that there are trade-offs both in times of cost and and in terms of supporting staff in actually delivering this and, and keeping students engaged over extended school times so so what we've tried to do in the guide is to to highlight uh, the evidence and, and allow schools to make an informed decision about where that's appropriate uh, and then finally uh, thinking through some wider strategies, so so things like access to technology, things like summer support have also been discussed. I, I know we're well into the summer now, but, but potentially looking at the next summer and the way that we might support people to, to not have additional learning loss over summer periods. Again, um, th there is evidence that that is impactful, but, but also expensive and, and very hard to implement and, and hard to engage pupils with. Um, and really the take home from all of this evidence is actually that there isn't going to be a quick fix, that, that the idea that we can get back to school quickly, do a few interventions and have everyone caught up by Christmas it, it is just simply not going to be the case. Um, we're going to need to have a, a long term strategy um, which, which probably combines many of these approaches to, to help actually close that attainment gap and, and benefit the poorest pupils that may have been impacted worst by school closures. Uh, and then if we move on to the next slide, um, looking at the evidence base probably the the most promising approach might be uh, things like intensive small group tuition that, that might be able to target disadvantaged pupils and, and provide substantial impact on learning uh, and one of the initiatives that uh, we've recently launched in fact the website just went online today is the national tutoring program which i think is going to be a really uh, substantial and positive program that, that is able to have an impact on improving the outcomes for those disadvantaged pupils um, and, and the motivation behind the National Tutoring Programme is the idea that there is a very strong evidence base for, for small group interventions that, that help uh, impact on the attainment, particularly for disadvantaged pupils. If you look across all of the randomised control trials that the EF have run, uh, most of the, the big impacts that we're seeing for disadvantaged pupils come from intensive small group approaches that, that provide that additional support. Um, it, it's also the case that in the current system, Tutoring is, a, is both a wild west, it's, it's, an, it's a, a system that isn't particularly uh, well regulated where there's deep variation in quality and, and that often the programmes that get chosen by schools might be the ones with the glossiest brochure rather than the ones that have the, the best focus on learning. Um, and the aim of the National Tutoring Programme is to, to provide guidance and, and quality standards so that we can flag to schools what are the best bets uh, when we come to these small group interventions for, for providing the best catch up for those disadvantaged pupils. And, and the second thing that it aims to do is, is right the wrong in the current system, which is this, this billion dollar industry of tutoring is currently a gap widener because it's currently something that actually uh, is accessed by people that can pay for it and, and not targeted at the pupils that need it most. So the, the aim of the National Tutoring Programme, and, and very happy to go into more depth in, in terms of questions in the Q&A, um, but, but the aim of the National Tutoring Programme is to to target disadvantaged pupils and, and really provide that additional learning support that we know can have a really strong impact on, on closing the attainment gap and, and compensating for this period of, of learning loss. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. And I definitely recommend that everyone takes a look at the report, which is fantastic. And I saw a question come in about which report it was. We'll actually send out a link to that report when we send the slides so that you can all take a look. 
Um, for now, moving to, to make sure we get through the content, I'm going to pass on to you, Natalie, and we'll come to the questions later on. So next slide, please, Ashton. Great. Thank you again, Anna. <clears throat> um, so back in May, EPI did a report um, that was aimed at government, but also to inform a inquiry by the Education Select Committee on how the government should respond to, um, to the impact of the pandemic on education and young people's outcomes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the next few slides um, summarise our key recommendations that were that was in um, that report. Um, so I'll just go through them fairly briefly now. So the first uh, category was around supporting young people's well-being, and it's really worth saying here that the pandemic hasn't necessarily created any new problems. What it has done is it's perpetuated the problems and it's amplified the problems that were already clear and systemic in our education and our social care system. So a lot of the solutions we would have need to address anyway if we want to create a more equitable um, set of outcomes for young people. So starting off with well-being, um, Prior to the pandemic, over the past decade, um, local authority spending on children's services, so here we're talking about early intervention, youth services, um, uh, what else, um, wider children's services as well. Um, it was cut, th those uh, services over the past decade were cut by 20% per child in real terms. That includes a 1 billion cut to uh, Sure Start and a 900 million uh, pound cut to youth services. Um, in a pandemic, it's more difficult when schools are closed down for, that, for those schools to pick up the pieces of, of, of those cuts to wider children's services. And that, you know, with before the pandemic, schools were the ones who saw children and were able to um, identify whether they needed extra, um, extra help or support from the social care system. With the closure of schools, that hasn't been able to happen. So what we've recommended is that there should be additional and sustained funding for the services um, that ought to be um, identifying young people early on um, if they need additional help and providing um, young people with positive activities. Um, there also needs to be clear national standards for social care services. So again, we see um, a real postcode lottery in terms of the quality of uh, children's services across the country as measured by Ofsted. We need some clear national standards as to what every family can expect across the country. Um, and that needs to be in normal times, not just during a pandemic. Um, and then Jonathan touched on this. We recommended, it's too late now, but we recommended um, establishing summer well-being camps, not academic catch-up programs over the summer, but camps that were that would have been more focused on young people's engagement, outdoor activities, um, positive activities with their peers and pastoral support. And it wouldn't have had to rely on the teaching workforce who we know are under contractual obligations about when they can and can't work, but it could um, have galvanized the wider young people's workforce, including play workers and early years workers um, to help run and staff these camps. It's a real missed opportunity um, in our view. Um, could we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, then in terms of preventing that disadvantage gap from widening, we recommended that the government provided targeted funding for at least a year um, for pupils eligible for the pupil premium. So those in the early years, um, and then those at key transition points, so entering year one, 
in September, entering year seven in September, and then in year 11, um, who will be taking their GCSEs next year, we recommended the pupil premium should be doubled and that schools should be able to use that money to provide evidence-based interventions, whether that's one-to-one -one or small group tuition or, um, or something else. Um, we also recommended that the eligibility criteria should be broadened so that children who currently have a child protection plan receive the pupil premium and they receive the same higher rate as uh, those who are currently looked after. Um, and then finally, recognising that not all, but some pupils are likely to return to school having experienced trauma, bereavement, neglect, anxiety, um, the government should issue new guidance to schools to deter them from punitive uh, measures if those kinds of um, uh, impact manifest themselves in poor behaviour. So rather than um, temporary or permanently excluding pupils or um, off-rolling them, the, the government should be clear to schools that they should look at um, uh, more at other methods for um, being inclusive to those pupils and supporting them through, uh, through whatever trauma they may have experienced. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally in this section, we made a series of recommendations for how the government should uh, better support post-16 provision in light of the pandemic. But again, this isn't just about in light of the pandemic, it's what the government ought to be doing anyway. It just becomes more important because of the pandemic. Um, so permanently funding post-16 education in alternative provision. At the moment, if you're um, excluded from your school because of poor behaviour, for example, and you go to an alternative um, provision setting, um, that education ends at 16 and you have to go either to an FE college, a school sixth form, which is unlikely, or into the labour market. And actually we're saying that there should be um, post-16 provision to allow those young people, most of whom are incredibly vulnerable already, extra time to, um, uh, to catch up with their academic attainment and their um, social and emotional development as well. Also, like the pupil premium, we recommend doubling funding for disadvantaged students um, between the ages of 16 to 19 to, um, to compensate for their lost learning time. We think that um, 16 to 19 vocational courses should be extended for an additional year, A, to mitigate against the lost learning time, but also because um, we keep them in the education system for another year and avoid them going out into an incredibly uh, competitive um, uh, market, a labour market that's facing an economic downturn. Um, we think there should be greater flexibility for uh, apprenticeships, acknowledging that they, there has been lost learning time and a sudden uh, or a potential reduction in the number of apprenticeships. Um, and there should be greater incentives for um, slightly older learners who want to reskill. So for young adults aged 19 and over, they should be granted a maintenance loan um, if they want to uh, take up their first level three qualification. And there'll, be great, there'll need to be greater support for adult reskilling because again, prior to the pandemic, um, our adult reskilling um, uh, reputation was incredibly low um, and our offer was low compared to other OECD countries. So this becomes even more important um, post pandemic and during uh, an economic downturn. So those are the recommendations or the key recommendations that we put to government 
um, back in May, some of which they've already missed the boat, but many of which there's still an opportunity for them to take action. Thank you so much, Natalie. And I, I think really useful to point out that COVID just adds extra urgency to some of these recommendations that you've been making for a while. And when we get on to our using COVID and this disruption to make some changes for the better, I think there is potential that some changes that are going to be made now due to this crisis may actually, fingers crossed, become long lasting changes. So we'll get into that in a bit. And just to say, um, as, as with the slides that Jonathan shared, uh, this is based on a, another in incredibly useful report um, and I think there was a question in the uh, Q&A asking for the link to the report so Natalie we can we can share that after the webinar or um, in the Q&A if you're able to share it uh, yeah. but for now over to you Raj to share the perspective from the front line and Ashton can you move forward yes yeah, fantastic thanks okay so I thought it might be helpful just to outline I think what will be a three-stage recovery process in the near term so this is this is certainly what's going on in the school I'm teaching at and I think a lot of schools will be doing something like this and this might be helpful for all of us as we try and work with those schools uh, to recover. The first thing that I think needs to happen is assessment. So I think pretty much every school would have every year group assessed in every subject at the end of the school year. Almost certainly that's the case and that just won't have happened. So I think a strong recommendation for schools would have been Take those assessments that you would have done at the end of last year and do them at the beginning of the year. Um, now, you may have incomplete attendance. Uh, you may not feel it's appropriate in various ways. I think it's really useful just to have that data and not just assume where these different students are going to be or what they know and what they don't know. I think assessments would be useful. And I think the same goes for attendance. We don't know what that's going to look like, I don't think. And so I think just a bit of fact finding in those first, that first week or two is going to be really useful for schools. Uh, the second stage, I think, um, I really liked uh, what uh, Jonathan and Natalie were both saying about, there's an initial part where schools have to take the lead. They don't know what their own capacities are and what their own needs are. And it's brilliant that we've got so many participants on the call and I'm sure lots of providers will want to be doing stuff, but schools are going to need a good month or two just to work out what's going on themselves and what they can do with their own resources. I think that's also going to be helpful for external programs when they come in that they're going into a more stable context a little bit later so i think that second part of internal support schools can be uh, adapting or, or developing their own interventions to support attainment or attendance i'm going to give you one example that we've recently done in bristol if we go to the next slide please Ashley. Uh, so this was a project that we did to improve attendance uh, across bristol uh, we've done a lot of parent communications previously and where we've been adding value at Behavioural Insights team is just by taking parent communications and personalising them, simplifying them, just making it really, really clear what we're trying to get across. Also, for those of you, you know, there's a blog post where you can read about it in more detail, but I think we're in this strange world where going to school is no longer going to be the norm. And so it's really important that we emphasise the loss. Okay, so loss aversion in behavioural economics has it's more powerful to emphasise what's being missed we are going to have to make an effort to explain to parents who are concerned about bringing their kids in that if, as long as it's safe for them, we are going to have to communicate the days being lost. You can see the results on the right. It has had an effect. If you show on the next slide, that experiment was actually interrupted by school closures. And um, I mean, there's lots of different ways to interpret this. But what was interesting is that even as attendance was declining overall, those who were receiving our text messages emphasizing how important it is not to be missing out on learning did have higher attendance so it can be robust to those kind of closures uh, if we go to the next slide please Ashley. so right so after there's been an assessment and after schools have been given a bit of space to work out what they can do themselves with their own resources i then think they're ready to work with external providers external strategies from about autumn half term onwards and I think it's brilliant, the National Tutoring Programme. Jonathan, you mentioned the website has gone live. Make sure you do share the URL with everybody. Um, but I think it's going to take a month or two before people even realise how they're going to use that. And if you go to the next slide, please, Ashley, I think there are some general behavioural insights principles which are useful to keep in mind here. The number one is just to simplify the communications. Now, I think DfE have done a good job at putting this really comprehensive guidance up there. But I've read a lot of research in my time and it's a heavy lift to get through that. And I think we can't underestimate how helpful it's going to be 
that as and when we have specific asks for schools, parents and children and everybody, if you can make those discrete asks, like now is the time to be thinking about which kids might be needing tuition. Now is the time to be getting your kids back to school. It's really, really going to be helpful to go through the SMART acronym and really break it down for people. I think that's in this really complex world where none of us know when we're wearing masks or what we're doing, really break it down. It's going to be super helpful. On that point, putting users first. So I love the way that EEF are talking about the National Tutoring Programme and with EdTech providers out there, we just need to be aware that these have to be tools for teachers and parents to use. Teachers are anticipating a very, very tough year. As much as we can customise what we're providing externally for their purposes, rather than maybe selling what we think is useful about it, I think that's really, really going to help. You know, think of it as a tool for them rather than a medicine that we're having them take. And the third point is uh, well-being. So I think it's really important what Natalie was talking about, being mindful of students' well-being. But I think everybody's in for a big year. And as we're partnering with schools and trying to support them through this, I think it's really important just to have that calm and focused approach. There's going to be stressed people, maybe working out what a regional lockdown is going on, and let's all just be patient with each other. And on well-being, as well as the camps and Natalie describing, there is a literature on exercises that schools can deliver, um, which are reasonably straightforward, and we're planning on publishing some more resources about that on blogs. So I just think those three principles are important to bear in mind as we go forward. Um, that's it from me from now. I'm happy for us to move on. Uh, fantastic. Thanks, Raj. And one, one quick question came in, which I, I think we have a, an easy answer to you, on whether assessment should take place straight away or whether there should be a period of, sort of reflection and settling back in to understand feelings about the pandemic before going straight into assessment. Um, uh, different schools will have different philosophies on it, but I think you certainly want a moment just to acknowledge what's happened. But I think, for example, my own school just goes, if we get back to business as usual as quickly as we possibly can, that's almost the most supportive thing you can do for the students and just being like mindful that some students may have gone through some traumas and having a tailored approach to them but as quickly as possible just going right it's school we all know how this works you've done assessments before let's just crack on as quickly as possible personally i've subscribed to that approach but i would totally respect schools who might want to give that other thing more space uh, fantastic. And one extra question before we, we move on to resetting and then come back to questions at the end uh, around uh, pupils who don't get the grades they're expecting um, and the impact on them. You know, what are they going to be able to do to um, to make up for that? What impact is that going to have in a, in a long sense, given that they are, you know, haven't that many of them won't have um, have actually been studying much over the last few months it's going to be a pretty big impact on them any thoughts on how to support that group so i think uh, many of you. natalie and jonathan will certainly have thoughts on this which is a big issue and perhaps we can come back to it again at the end but i think in the near term if we're talking about those who have you know been given qualifications uh, been given grades by ofqual and their schools i know there are procedures where they can retake exams and so on um, I'm not quite sure what that will look like. I think it would be interesting to hear Natalie and Jonathan's uh, input from that later. I think in the near term, I think there will be a big preparation of resources to support students in that, near, in that first half term and going, right, actually this bit seems solid, these students we need here. I imagine a lot of schools will repurpose a lot of their interventions which are already running towards addressing the gaps which are highlighted in the assessments. And I think schools will have their own innovative a combination of innovative and continuation of their own routines would both be helpful. But I think that's a really important question to come back to at the end with Natalie and Jonathan input in as well. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that one then. And just to say that for those students who are going to be arriving in higher education, having had a long period where they haven't been learning, they are, of course, much more likely to feel insecure academically and they're more likely to need extra catch up support and extra study support compared to, to students who have had learning right up until the, the end of uh, the summer term and so there's going to be an extra burden on higher education providers to help with that catch up and help with providing that sense of belonging and reassurance about you know it's normal to worry that you might not be good enough academically that's just due to the COVID situation it's you're all going through it so there's definitely a big burden there on higher education as well uh, yes so but to keep us moving then let's move on to the final section which is looking at resetting the system for the better so are there elements of this, the catch up activity that is going to be happening that could be continued uh, long term or any other ways in which the disruption 
following COVID could actually be used to improve the system for the better. So over to you, Jonathan, for your thoughts. And, and conscious of time, so I'll quickly run through the, these five principles that, that we think are really important. So, so first of all, um, I think one of the really powerful things that's happened over this period are the types of conversations that we've had around disadvantage, be that from uh, discussions about provision of free school meals for people over the school holidays, or just the way that we've framed conversations around the types of peoples that, that are most likely to be missing out during this this period of school closures. And, and that's something that, that we think is really crucial to keep hold of, and particularly to keep hold of from the early years up, right up till post 16. So, so that question about resets actually raised a, a really interesting point, which is, as a system, we're really bad at supporting pupils that, that failed the first time off or, or don't meet the expected standards first time off. So if you look at resets in, in post 16, that the number of people that need to continuously reset English or maths qualifications that, that don't make any improvement because we haven't really worked out the best ways to support those pupils is, is really quite shocking. And, and, and considering disadvantage, particularly in the post-16 and, and early years sector, is something that we should really hold on to as, as we move out of it, this uh, environment and try and reset education. Uh, the second thing to highlight, and, and to be honest, this is something that I'll highlight in every presentation that I give, uh, regardless of, of COVID or not, is just to keep and maintain that focus on high quality teaching. And I think a lot of people in periods of homeschooling have really begun to appreciate the, the level of professionalism we have in the sector and the importance of the support that teachers provide. And I think focusing on, on how we can retain those teachers, how we can support those teachers, for example, through uh, the early career as they first join, we have incredibly high turnover in the English school system in terms of teachers and, and focusing on how we can continue to retain and support those colleagues is, is incredibly important. Um, as a third principle, thinking more about the providing targeted academic support and, and how this might continue after the, the initial reopening is going to be really important. I mean, thinking about things like the National Tutoring Programme and, and how that might continue to, be, to support disadvantaged peoples, even as we move out uh, of a recovery phase and, and think more about some of the endemic problems in terms of gaps between uh, disadvantaged peoples um, in the current system. Uh, and, and the fact that we're, we're doing this and the fact that we are directly trying to support those peoples is a positive step that, that I certainly hope will, will continue in the future. And I hope that we acknowledge that you know, six months a year isn't going to be enough to, to provide the support that pupils are, are going to need. Um, fourth, um, sustaining positive relationships with parents. Well, one of the things that's really interesting about the evidence base on parental support is that we know that it's incredibly important, but we don't really have, have many great ideas on, on how to do it. So, so some of the interventions that Raj flagged are great because they're, they're some of the few well-evidenced approaches to engaging parents. Um, but, but generally speaking, uh, we're not great at engaging with parents, particularly parents from disadvantaged backgrounds, even though we know that makes a big difference. Uh, and I think a lot of schools have seen certainly changes in relationships with parents over the, the last few months. Um, some of them really positive in terms of the support that schools have been providing within a community. Um, and it's going to be crucial to, to hang on to that and, and work out how we can build those relationships in the future. Uh, and finally, and, and this is a very EF thing to say, but, but continuing to put the, hand, the, the evidence in the hands of teachers and school leaders is, is going to be crucial because they're the people that are going to be best, um, best placed to make those decisions that, that benefit people. So uh, the EF and other organisations has a responsibility to communicate that evidence clearly, but, but it's most empowering when it's in the hands of, of teachers and school leaders. And we're already seeing really positive things whereby People like Ofsted are, are now producing evidence summaries to, to back up the, the, the frameworks that they put out. And, and that's really being led by empowered teachers and school leaders that, that are now asking when they're given an intervention or, or told to do something, what's the evidence for that? And I think that's a really positive trend in education that, that we hope continues uh, as we reset education for the future. Fantastic. Thanks, Jonathan. And uh, Natalie, could you just share maybe uh, one or two minutes of your extra extra thoughts on resetting? Yeah, again, uh, and, and this is underlined by the point that this reset is important in normal times, um, but more so in a pandemic. And it actually uh, covers a lot of what Jonathan has said already. Um, so a focus on the early years, including 
professionalising the workforce. Um, our annual lecture last year was given by Professor Kiribo Jackson, who'd done really important work in the US, um, finding that extra investment in the early years sustained into schools has a long-term impact, not just on academic outcomes and graduation rates, but also labor market participation and lower incarceration rates. So in any scenario, we need to have um, greater, we need to give greater priority to the early years. Um, as I talked about earlier, a focus on inclusion, particularly um, around um, giving greater transparency around managed moves and behavioural policies. Um, what we see in some behavioural policies is that they are they're, they're overly punitive um, and actually we think there needs to be a shift away from that to, um, to being more supportive for pupils who are suffering from the effects of COVID. Um, a better distribution of qualified teachers in the most challenging areas. So research that we did a couple of years ago in EPI found that um, using um, whether a teacher has a, a degree or a relevant degree in their taught subject as a metric of quality. We recognize it's not the only metric of quality, but it is an evidence-based metric of quality. We found that outside London, pupils living in the poorest areas are far less likely to be taught by a maths or physics teacher than their peers. In fact, only around, I think it was 18% of physics teachers in the poorest areas outside London actually had a relevant degree um, in their taught subject. Um, so we think there needs to be um, a greater focus on redressing that gap. Um, accountability plays an important part in the disadvantage gap. We know that there has been a bias in Ofsted judgments against schools with more disadvantaged intakes. Um, and even under the new Ofsted framework, which is more focused on uh, curriculum breadth than um, academic data, we still see that bias in some of the early analysis that has, um, that has happened. That has the impact of uh, driving teachers out of those schools or deterring them from joining those schools in the first place. So we really need to think about the incentives that we're creating through our accountability system. And then finally, post-16 education, I talked about the greater need for, uh, for more funding to address the cuts that we've seen since 2011-12. Um, there also needs to be greater maintenance support to allow um, older students or young adults to retrain where they need to. And um, again, in line, looking at how we stack up compared to other OECD countries, um, there's a strong argument to have a broader post-16 curriculum than we do now. So that's the kind of five ways that we would reset the system in EPI. Fantastic. Thanks, Natalie. And Raj, any, any final additional thoughts from us on this one? Actually, just in response to the questions that have been coming through. So I think it'd be great if we kept the NTP up. Put that aside. There's been a lot of comments about how we've been focusing on attainment and gaps and not enough discussion of mental health. I want to be clear, we totally hear that. I mean, something that I think about every day is when I go back into school and I've got my form group and the, the kids that I teach, there's a big moment there. Like, uh, I think we'll all be different for it. Jonathan mentioned there's going to be changes in the relationships with parents. There'll be changes in relationships with the students. There's a sense that we've all been through something I'm sure it will be very emotional and I trust pastoral teams in schools will be on top of that um, or doing their best to be on top of that. Uh, I completely respect if schools would want to spend more time on that. and I'm certainly not discouraging anybody from doing that. And I just want to be clear to everybody who's raised that point. I think we agree well-being and safeguarding is paramount as it always is in schools. Um, but we have been focused on what we do about the learning gap because we're worried about the long-term consequences of that. But I just wanted to acknowledge that point that a lot of people have been raising with that and maybe we've got time for one or two questions.
Uh, yes, fantastic. And actually, there's a, another question that, that's somewhat related that I, I wanted to quickly cover, um, which was a question about how long the negative impact would last, the negative impact of um, the gaps that have uh, increased, so inequality that has increased in terms of educational outcomes during this period. And there has been some worrying research from the US looking at this, which has found that if there isn't effective compensation for this period, then we would expect that there would be a lifelong impact in terms of lost earnings of around $16,000 over a student's lifetime as a result of if we expect a five month period of school closures. So the, the impact here is lifelong and very dramatic, but as Raj says, we have been focusing on that, um, but the, the well-being issues really go hand in hand and they are just as important. And also it should be said that effective learning and catching up won't be possible without addressing people's well-being. So the, the two really do need to go hand in hand. Um, there's been one or two other questions that have come in that I'll try to address quickly. Um, I don't know if anybody knows of any children who have actively benefited from homeschooling. Any panelists, have you heard of any of that situations like that? I think if there's silence, then unfortunately that means that we haven't heard particularly of any examples of this. Um, so that's, I think, a, a not a good news story there. Um, quick extra question here. This might have to be the last because we've got very little time. Um, any thoughts from the panelists, perhaps EPI, on um, what can be done in the higher education sector to um, help people catch up? Um, actually, I have, I have one thought on this first because it was a question relating to behavioral insights. Um, and we do have a few thoughts here. So for example, there's been an intervention that's been tested effectively in the US. Um, it's a belonging intervention. So it, it addresses this well-being issue. The idea is that when students join a new institution, typically all students feel worried that they don't fit in. Uh, you know, we, we all have that fear when we join a new institution. We worry we won't be good enough academically, that we won't make friends. And then we interpret setbacks negatively. This exercise reassures students that everybody goes through that. It's normal to feel that way, but it passes. And what we've seen is that that exercise boosts students' feelings of belonging, makes them more willing to engage with university support services because they realize it's temporary, it's not to do with me, so I deserve to use these services and I'll, I'll improve as a result. Um, and it actually has boosted retention pretty dramatically, um, up to 80% in some studies, and it's reduced attainment gaps between disadvantaged students and others by up to 50%. So it could be particularly useful right now, and we definitely recommend that higher education institutions, as with all institutions, look at various different ways to support students' well-being, including these sorts of exercises. Now, unfortunately, we have just run out of time, and I know Natalie has to run off. So I wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers for sharing such wonderful insights. As I said before, we'll make sure that we share with you the content that has been uh, presented today, as well as links to the further research. If you do have any questions for us, um, if you could flip forward two slides, Ashling, um, we would love it if you got in touch with us. So we've got um, the emails for both Raj and, and me here, um, and please do get in touch if either you're interested in participating in any of our future trials, uh, or you're interested in working for us, or you just have any follow-on questions that we weren't able to get to, and we'll try to reply to you by email.